Well, Your Excellency, I would have gladly ceded my time. <laughs> that was just a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, it, it, it reminded me of the, uh, the maxim to think globally and act locally. And I'm really sad to say that it, presently, my country, we have a lot of very local thinking and very global acting. So it's going to be extremely important that middle power countries, uh, middle power countries, like beginning in Middleburg, <laughs> come back to their leadership role because the modern world largely began here with, with local leaders like yourself, sir, who came together in this region just a few hundred years ago and said, let's do a new way of thinking, a new way of business, a new way of living. And I have had uh, extremely inspiring inspirations from my friend Simon, who is deeply grounded in the cultural heritage of the region and why it's so important to remember the web of time as you remember the web of life of today. Because the web of time of 800 years ago is not that long ago. People were not that different than we are. I mean, they, were, they lived differently, but they, they were not a different species. What were the issues that they were dealing with? And what happened here, really, in the uh, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, changed the world, completely changed the world. Let's go back to the 16th century. What were people thinking about? What was going on? What was going on was the dominance, the total dominance of the world of the institution of the Catholic Church. And not far from here, uh, it, not far from here, there was a guy, Luther, as you know, who began the reformation of the world in, pro in protesting against the organization at the time. And what offended him more than anything was the idea that by paying another human being, you could believe that, quote, you could have your soul restored to the state of innocence which was enjoyed at baptism and relieved of all pains of purgatory, including those incurred by an offense to the divine majesty, God himself. So he posted this, his protest on the wall in Wittenberg, they preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as the money clinks into the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. So the why of the time that everyone was thinking about in this part of the world was how do I get my soul to God? That was what the people were thinking about. They, were, they weren't particularly rich. They struggled hard. Life was hard. But that's what they thought about. And then there were people here, like Ar Arminius, Hugo de Groot, Erasmus, who thought, wait a minute, these are just people. We can reason this out. We don't need any magic. We can have a personal relationship with the great mystery that gives us life. We can work together. We don't need this hierarchical system. We've learned to work together in this particular region to deal with the environmental challenges of being below sea level. We've discovered that if we listen to one another, we come up with better ideas if we learn to cooperate. And that we don't silence people before they speak, believing that we know what they're going to say, so we allow dissent and argument and debate. And it then leads to this brilliant idea that Hugo de Groot comes up with. We call him Hugo Grotius, all right? Just right up the road in Rotterdam. He comes up with the idea of the freedom of contract, that people can come up with agreements amongst one another that they don't inherit from a previous generation, that they're free to bargain. And he actually says 
that when free individuals come to a fair contract in the marketplace, this is a divine activity, that justice is manifest in balance, and that that justice is a manifestation of the divine. And therefore, the commercial endeavor is as important as the monk in a monastery praying to God for purposes of the soul's transcendence of space and time and union with the divine mystery. In other words, the marketplace becomes equal to the monastery for the purposes of the why of that time. The why of that time was the liberation of the soul. And out of that energy that's released, the limited liability corporation where people cooperate with risks and benefits, the emergence of a culture of commerce and engagement and openness and creativity takes place here in this area. For better or for worse, the limited liability corporation is the model with which business is done today. And where are we today, though? It seems to me that the global challenge of every human being on the planet remains. Why? Why are we here? Where did we come from? Where are we going? That's always the perennial question. That was the question Adam probably had, and it's the question our ancestors will have. Why am I here? Why, where am I going? And at the time, when Middleburg and this area was the idea-generating center for the world, the why of business was the liberation of the soul. Now we have a much more utilitarian why, but it's still based, as Your Excellency pointed out, on values. But these values now have been occluded by our incredible fascination with the how. Science and technology have given us so much power, so much capacity to manipulate the natural world that there's very little discussion in the academic institutions and in our political institutions of the why. So we have a terribly dangerous situation. We have philosophy without the pursuit of truth. It's philosophy mainly about the methodology of philosophy is taught. We have modern art, which is mainly art about art, about the how of art. We have law without justice. I practiced law for 22 years in a major American city. I can tell you most of the time was devoted to the how very little about the principles of justice. And I've taught law in a university, and I can tell you, you can become a lawyer, at least in the United States, without ever taking a course on justice. We have medicine without healing. The main conversation about medicine in my country now is all about economics and insurance. It's not about how do you heal people, how do you make people healthy, what's well-being. It's all about the flow of business. It's not about healing. We have religious institutions without love and transcendence. They're all about just coming together. We have these mega churches in the United States. I mean, they are about as healthy for the soul as a McDonald's is for your body. And we have weapons without security. The nuclear weapon being the perfect example. The more you perfect the weapon, the less security you obtain. We're, we're preoccupied with our own powers of how, and we have to come back to the values of why. We have to bring security back to what are the real measurable security interests that we have. And for the first time in human history, unlike a few hundred years ago here, we are the first generation that has to decide consciously whether we will be the last generation. This is not something our ancestors had to decide. All this began after 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt articulated the four freedoms. The thought that we have to consciously decide whether we will be ancestors did not exist then. Simply, simply wasn't on the, on the horizon. It wasn't a thought. That came about, that came about because of an amazing event in the Almagorda Desert. As Albert Einstein said, the nuclear bomb has changed everything but our thinking, and we are headed toward annihilation if we don't change our thinking. But, so I want to bring you back to a moment in time. 5.29 a.m., July 16th, 1945, the first atom bomb was tested in a portion of a bleak, barren Alamogorda bombing range in the New Mexico desert, chillingly named Ornado de Morta, Journey of Death. That was the name of this place where they did it. Before they did it, that was what it was called. After the thunderous roar of the shockwave, a huge pillar of smoke rose 30,000 feet, creating the first icon of the nuclear age, the fearsome mushroom cloud, a blast of energy of unprecedented destructive magnitude bathed the surrounding mountain in a brilliant light that could be seen 150 miles away. J. Robert Oppenheimer, the director of the Los Alamos Laboratory, the organization responsible for the design of the first atomic bomb as part of the Manhattan Engineer District of the War Department, uttered a sober description from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. So after that, a few weeks later, we dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. It's a relatively small bomb. It was about 15,000 tons of TNT. That was the equivalent. We now have over 15,000 of these devices, most of them in the megaton, megaton range. That's a million tons of TNT. A million tons of TNT. That's the equivalent of 70 Hiroshima's. The Soviets dropped a 50 megaton bomb in their testing. That was the equivalent of about 3,000 Hiroshima's. That's what we're able to do. Uh, the human mind simply cannot imagine this destructive capacity. We now know from scientific modeling of some professors in Rutgers University in New Jersey that if a mere 100 went off between India and Pakistan, that it would throw enough soot into the stratosphere to lower the temperature of the planet a degree and a half Celsius for at least a decade, basically ending agriculture and civilization. So we're all downwind all of a sudden to the security of India and Pakistan. So the local entrepreneur has a new freedom he has to be consider, which is the freedom of life itself. Because what has happened now is every local issue in India and Pakistan has now become a global issue. The human family, the web of life has come so closely together. And it's largely because of this amazing process of globalization, which began here. See, when the United States first built the nuclear bomb, we thought, oh, we could keep it to ourselves and no one else will get it. How naive. How naive was that? We didn't understand that ideas and science don't carry passports, just like pandemic diseases don't carry passports, and just like commerce no longer carries passports, just like the multinational corporation no longer carries passports, just like the East Indies Corporation went global from right here. People said, we will come together here and go global. So the scientific endeavor in the pursuit of the security of one state has now become an existential global problem that affects every single human being on the planet. So we are today subject to the security of a computer in Pakistan ensuring that what appears to be a nuclear launch from India is just a kid hacking. then they have very little time to determine whether that's a hack or a real threat. 
In the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the world almost destroyed itself, or not the world almost destroyed itself, where the Soviet Union and the United States almost destroyed the world because people here didn't play in that game. <clears throat> we have 13 days. In uh, September of 1983, the computers in the then Soviet Union showed a full-scale American launch. A full-scale American launch. And there was one man who saved the world. And every human life since him is beholden to his courage and his choice. His name was Stanislav Petrov. Very broken man. Uh, he was a very sad man. He, he uh, was an alcoholic. He's been through alcoholism. He lost his wife to cancer. Uh, he grew up, uh, he was, uh, his family put him in the Soviet military when he was 17. But there was one moment in time when the computers showed a full-scale American launch in September of 1983, and he was the man on watch, and he knew that if he passed the information up the command and control, that they would have launched 11,000 nuclear warheads to the United States, and everybody in this town would be dead. And every entrepreneur has to think about that. And what are we protecting? And what is sustainability? I bought my gas the other day at a Russian concession, Luke Oil. I was driving a car made in Japan. When my computer went on the blink the other day, I was on the phone with a kid in Bangalore. And the money for these goods and services was borrowed from China. So why are we pointing these nuclear weapons at each other when this is the reality of the world we live in? So Stanislav Petrov didn't pass it up the command and control because I interviewed him for a Norwegian documentary and he said, God didn't want me to end the world. And I was a computer engineer. And I knew computers make mistakes. And then he said, and my superiors didn't know whether to reward me or to punish me for violating my protocols. But what bothered them more than anything was that I believed in God. <laughs> because the why of the Soviet state was very much against the belief in God. That was very important for them. I'm going to show you a little bit of a video of, uh, that a friend of mine, uh, Dr. William Perry, who is the former, uh, former Secretary of Defense of the United States, made. Uh, because he also was awakened one night at 3.15 3 in the morning and told there was a Soviet launch against us. And he... Uh, he checked it up, checked on it, and decided that it wasn't. But there was a moment where he knew that there was about eight minutes to decide whether the human experiment would continue. Because the weapons were on launch on warning then, that you use them before you get hit with the first volley. We think the problem's over because the Cold War's over. Think anything has changed? No, they're still on launch on warning, and there's still over 15,000 of them. In 1995, Boris Yeltsin had what would be like the football opened up. He was just, the codes were ready because a weather satellite had been launched off the coast of Norway. The Norwegians had told the Russians they were going to do it, but it didn't get passed up the command and control. And the first volley of a nuclear exchange, the first volley of a nuclear exchange would be an electromagnetic pulse over Moscow, frying the electrical systems and communication of command and control. It's an interesting thing. Uh, there were a number of oopses that nobody thought about when we first made the nuclear weapons, like the effect of radiation on the genetic code, the electromagnetic pulse, we hadn't thought about those effects. We hadn't thought about the soot in the stratosphere. Most of science is a series of experiments, 
and you know, you learn from experimentation, like we had fire, and then like, oops, well, we better have fire extinguishers. We don't have the, uh, the opportunity to play with nuclear weapons, to play with the mistakes that we might make. There isn't any room for it. And Boris Yeltsin decided in an eight minute window that it would be okay because he knew Bill Clinton and said, I didn't think that Bill Clinton would do that. Those were the, it was, came down to a human relationship. At this moment, those human relationships are not that good. They're certainly not that good between India and Pakistan. And I'm not exactly sure what the relationship is between the president of my country and the Russians. It remains to be seen. I don't know what the bromance is or whether we just don't know. But we do know that there's a series of existential challenges, beginning with nuclear weapons, that brings the web of life together in a way that never happened before. And I would say that, that uh, because this new situation takes place after the, fourth, the four freedoms, there's some new rules we need to think about. I would call it like the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not kill everybody. <laughs> so let me talk about another issue that affects every entrepreneur that goes closer to business before we come back to the nuclear issue, which is, I call it the third lung. So imagine that as we're here, there's a third lung in the room that we're all sharing, such that for us to breathe, that lung has to be healthy. So if you, if, you, if, if you had an operation and you lost one of your lungs, you could live, but if that lung was unhealthy, we would all die. Well, there happens to be such a third lung on the planet Earth that every entrepreneur and every individual is sharing. It's called phytoplankton. It's a single cell organism in our oceans, and 50 to 75% of our, and there's some debate amongst scientists, but nobody says that anything less than 50% of our oxygen comes from the world's largest carbon dump, the most important other species that we rely on, phytoplankton. It produces our oxygen. And we are putting the health of the oceans at risk, not because of growth, as the prime minister pointed out, but because of irresponsibility, but because we are not allowing for the concern of the stakeholders of other living forms in our corporate decision making. It's not just workers that we're finding out are stakeholders, it's not just communities, it's other lives. There's a web of life. We're destroying species at a thousand times the evolutionary base rate. And we don't know at what point the web of life starts to break down. But we do know this. We know that the changing of the climate is affecting the health of the oceans. And we know now, we didn't know this 50 years ago, we now know that we depend on the health of the phytoplankton to breathe. We know this. This is... This is a fact of life. And we know that we do not have an adequate international regime in place to protect the oceans. We don't have the cooperation necessary to do that. We don't have the treaty to do it. And the parties that need to cooperate to do this are squaring off with each other with nuclear weapons as a way of communicating. We don't want, nobody wants to use the weapons, but it's a way of talking to one another. And it's a completely dysfunctional way. Imagine trying to do business and you're sitting as an entrepreneur, sitting across the table from your counterpart and you both put guns on the table and say, let's talk. Somehow, the level of cooperation needed to deal with global threats like protecting the climate, like protecting the other third lung, the rainforests, like protecting the oceans, like dealing with pandemic diseases, like dealing with terrorism, cybersecurity, the new inventions of science, the new kinds of weapons that are coming through the pike, electromagnetic weapons, uh, nano weapons. I mean, it's just, 
you know, nuclear weapons are a 1930s physics with a 1940s technology. Weapons, have, weapons thinkers have, and technology has advanced, and we need legal regimes in place. So the corporate world is the predominant political institution in the world today. Corporations are bigger than most governments, and yet they're not fully grasping how important this is. And systemically, they're not able to. Systemically, they're not able to. The ideas behind the modern corporation have not really modernized to deal with the commensurate threats that we face, such as protecting the climate, protecting the oceans, and changing the geostrategic relationships. I'm going to end with an example in my own life. I was, a, I was a counsel, I was a lawyer in a company that was run by an entrepreneur. It was a franchising company, and franchisees would often borrow money from the company to expand their franchise base. And they would put their, their homes as collateral. And in one situation I had, I came in to the owner of the company, the entrepreneur who had created this company from his own creativity and from his own initiative, from all of the qualities that took place here several hundred years ago, discipline, perseverance, um, creativity, personal responsibility, expression of his own values. He enjoyed his franchise business because he was making other people rich, and that to him made him happy. He believed he was doing something virtuous and valuable, both to the people he was selling product to and to the franchisees. A win, 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 win across the board. And I came in with a stack of mortgage foreclosure documents of people who had not made their payments on the loans and said, what do I do with these? Do I take their houses? And the entrepreneur said, get out of my office. What kind of person do you think I am? What kind of values do you think I have? Because he as an individual had a conscience and he cared about people and he enjoyed making others rich and providing a service in the market that was meaningful and had values to him. The company then became a public company. And I had a similar situation. I went to the board of directors as the lawyer with mortgages for foreclosure. And they said, why are you bringing this to us? I said, because this is a terrible thing to do, to take people's homes away. And it'll affect our goodwill in the marketplace. Yes, Jonathan, but if we don't do this, you know, we could be liable to stockholders suing us for impairing their value and bringing into consideration considerations other than stockholder value. And we have a fiduciary duty to the market to increase stockholder value. We don't have a fiduciary duty to them. We have a legal duty to them. And our legal duty is what we have to fulfill. We are a de jure, a legal entity. So I, I say these points of bringing in stakeholder values into the market considerations has to become a de jure consideration, a legal consideration, that we need a new conversation about the legal structure of the corporation. We need a new conversation about what is a real threat and what is a artificial threat. I would say nuclear weapons are not a real threat. They're something that they, they do not provide security. They can't be used against countries that have them. It's suicidal. They're of no use against terrorists. And, uh, and, and you can't use them against countries that don't have them. And you here should be proud that your country is the only NATO country that came this week to the negotiations at the United Nations on a treaty to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons blanked out of the international media, one of the most important conversations on the planet ever to take place. Because as you know, biological weapons have been banned by treaty, and chemical weapons have been banned by treaty. Where we are today is 15,000 of these hanging over our heads, and imagine if the Biological Weapons Convention said, no country can use smallpox or polio as a weapon, but we will allow nine countries to use the plague as a weapon, for international security. We would say that's absurd. It flies in the face of any sense of reason or values. 
But that's precisely the situation we have in the world with nuclear weapons. And I think that the people of Holland, and, you know, you should be really proud that, you're the, that your country is participating in this discussion. And I think one of the reasons, one of the reasons is because you have leadership here that understands that the world that we're going to live in in the future has to be based on the very values that were expressed in business that began here in Middleburg and Rotterdam and this area a few hundred years ago. A sense of, uh, it's really, it's, people just don't, you, you don't know how important that conversation was here. It was a sense of personal expression of values, the highest values, only obtainable through cooperation. And this is what the world needs today. Maybe they came to that conclusion because they were dealing with an environmental threat because you're below sea level and you had to work together to deal with the rising, and rising tides. What does the world have to deal with today? Maybe it's be because you came together because there was the perception of external conflict with the Catholic world. Maybe you came together because, you, because there was chaos in Europe at the time. There was a 30 years war took place right afterwards. There was the war with the Spanish. Maybe it came together because there were visionaries like Erasmus and Hugo de Groot who thought things through, or, or Arminius, who thought things through. We don't really know why, but we know that it happened here. So to some extent, you're, this community is responsible for globalization. <laughs> and to some extent, I, I, for, to some extent, those ideas of creativity, those ideas of social responsibility, those ideas of leadership, were just expressed by your former prime minister. And I just, you know, I just wish he would change citizenship and run for office in my country. <laughs> because it is exactly that kind of perspective of seeing how to take primary institutions and bring values into them that took place here that has to take place in the world. And it's not going to come, it's not going to come from Russia or the United States. It's not going to come from us. In the security field, the, debates, the debate is distorted as follows. We have a turtle arguing for strategic stability, and then we have a horse arguing for military privilege. Guess which one wins? And in the meantime, the most basic promise of the nuclear age, embodied in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which calls for disarmament, doesn't even get on the table. It doesn't get in the public debate. It doesn't get in your newspapers. It doesn't even get discussed. What gets discussed is military expenditures or how do we get stability between Russia and the United States. But the real issue, which is how do we change to a realistic vision of security that depends on sustainable business practices that brings people out of poverty and gets science focused on creativity and bringing human values into the market, that discussion gets put on the side just like the disarmament discussion. And that discussion, that conversation of how do we change security to what's measurable, to what's scientifically measurable, it's kind of like, and I'm going to end with this, it's kind of like the Protestant Reformation was largely a response to anti-magic. The idea of transubstantiation of the wine into blood and you drink it and you get saved. It's kind of magical, right? You know? Of course, it's a mystical metaphor of union with the divine body of Christ and love. It's a metaphor. But it had a magical element that offended thinkers here. So let's get rid of it. Let's use reason and how we'll get to God. I think nuclear weapons are a totem of the same nature. They have a magical value. They don't bring security. The real security issues can be measured. The health of the oceans can be measured. 
The health of the climate can be measured. The elimination of poverty can be measured. The stability of communities can be measured. The health of the rainforests can be measured. The health of the water tables can be measured. We need to take magic out of security and bring science back to it and talk about what is our real, real interests. And that kind of conversation in the marketplace and how do we do the salvation of our souls through business, because that was the why at the time that took place here, is still kind of a, the same question. But let's frame it another way. How do we live like real human beings? How do we live like real human beings where we get to express loving kindness and compassion with one another? How do we live as real human beings where we respect the gift of this planet Earth? How do we live as real human beings where we can put all of our passion into business to do well and do good? How do we do that? That's the conversation that, that we need to take today. It's not just for the salvation of the soul. We may not call it that, but it's the same question. How do I live in a way that fulfills my heart, my passions, my soul, and my higher values that make me human? Because it's not enough just to get as much as you possibly can. It's not enough to say, I win if I die with the most toys. It's just not good enough. It doesn't, it doesn't satisfy. What satisfies is when you, when you do well and do good, because that's what it is to be human. We are good. We're not fallen. We're not decrepit creatures. We're capable of being human, and that's still the conversation. That's still the issue, and it took place here a few hundred years ago to the benefit of the world, and I hope that we can uh, expect again this part of the world to, uh, to stimulate that conversation because the whole world needs it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Granoff. Um, I thought you were to show us a little video, aren't you? Uh, well, I'd rather do some Q&A if we have the time. Yeah, uh, but I, but yeah. Well, we, we don't whichever. have the time, but we'll do it anyway. Yeah, let's do some Q&A, it's better. We'll skip the, I think I made the point. The video is a video representation of what would happen if somebody brought a, 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 did a, blew up a nuclear device in Washington, D.C., and the global effect of that. But it's pretty simple. All the, all the markets would close, and the whole world would collapse. You know, just one bomb. So, but, it's a, but I think people here, I think you got it. So let's see. If, I'd rather have some interaction. Thank you. And you talked about uh, India and also about uh, Pakistan, uh, nations which have a nuclear weapon. But what's your opinion about, let's say, your own country, United States? Should they have a nuclear weapon? To quote the Secretary General of the United Nations with respect to that question, he said, uh, there are no good arms for nuclear arms. So the idea that any state should have nuclear, first of all, there's only nine countries that have them. So the idea that any state should have them is abhorrent because the weapon violates international humanitarian law. It's unable to distinguish between civilians and combatants. It causes unnecessary suffering and it, uh, far beyond any legitimate military purpose. So no one is propounding unilateral disarmament. And the Indians, by the way, are calling for a universal treaty a nuclear weapons convention, very much like we have for chemical and biological. So, uh, you know, so the idea that, uh, that the weapon would be good for some and not good for others is preposterous. It's not good for anybody. So the, and the United States, because we were the only country to use a nuclear bomb, we have a moral responsibility to lead in getting rid of them. And the president said that we need them until people come to their sanity. Well. If, uh, any, if there's any soundbite we want here, President Trump, why don't you lead the world in coming to sanity? Ronald Reagan tried to do it. Now's the time to do it. I agree with your compliments to our former prime minister about maybe he should go for office. But the trouble is usually if you're in the power, because like when he was in the power, um, you're apparently too, too much part of the system. So especially sometimes it needs some time to open your eyes, because 
what I hear him say today is more or less what the party of the animals program is more or less. And I do miss some of his influence on the program of his own party. So I would suggest that you tomorrow <laughs> together go to The Hague and make it happen here now in our new governmental system. I mean, now is the chance and you have the influence. So please do so. That's, that's my question to you. I'll be going to the foreign ministry on Tuesday, but I, I, would, I, would, I would go with His Excellency anytime, anywhere. But I do want to, in all defense, point out that there were a lot of good things that happened during his presidency. And I think one of the points that he made was the sustainable development goals were created, and those really are a real human security agenda. If you look at, and I urge everyone to look at those sustainable development goals because they, they sort of drill down to the, to the local and global level. And they really are an attempt to shift the agenda from one of, uh, oh, this is really amazing. I was recently, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, the UN representative of this organization that has a yearly summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates. And we, we had a summit in, uh, in Bogota, Colombia where they've just suffered from a terrible 50 years of civil war. You know, uh, 8 million people in a relatively small country displaced, 300,000 killed, maybe a million maimed and injured. I mean, the whole country is traumatized. And the president of the country said that, and he's ending the civil war. He's ending it. And he said, he said that, I'm committed to moving my country from a model of fear to a model of love. Now, that's really bold for a head of state to say that. But I was sitting there thinking, you know, any time the countries go to war, and even in the Civil War, all of the military people invoke love of country, love of family, love of this, love, love of your religion, love of your race, love of something to go and kill. But when those of us who really care about peace talk about what we love, they call us idealists and unrealistic. So I say, spare me the realism who think we can continue business as usual and fry the planet. Spare me the realism of people who say we can continue to rely on nuclear weapons, on launch on warning status for our security. Spare me the realism that says it's acceptable that Billions of people can live in abject poverty. Spare me that realism. And let me follow those who believe that we can love each other and that we have to strive for that. And I think that your former prime minister, in the values that he expressed, were, his whole speech was completely positive. Mine was kind of negative positive. His was, you know, it was just all plus. Mine was more, more binary, you know? But... But all of the values that he expressed really come down to loving one another and loving the, loving the planet. And I think that conversation, we need, we need a, I, I, I'm going to close with this. I was at a meeting with Juan Somovia, who has uh, just been the president of the ILO several years ago. And he said, uh, it was a small luncheon. I was practicing law at the time. And, uh, and, and you know, part-time doing advocacy work, it was a, it was a, he, and he said, uh, everyone's come out of the closet, except the people who really believe in love and compassion. Uh, I, 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 why aren't you coming out of the closet? And I was sitting there going, oh my God, that's me. I, I, was, uh, I was hiding my higher values. I was unwilling to really come out and say what I really believed were the, were the values that make us human. And uh, my experience with so many people in business is they have those values and they really care about them, but they haven't precipitated the debate in the political sphere to change the laws so that all of the stakeholders in the corporate world can be considered, so that those values can be discussed. And yeah. I will talk to him and see maybe we could do something together. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much.